just two more panels and one quick presentation. Um, I've also been told by the organizers that in fact, this is the room where the gala dinner is going to be happening later this evening, which means that they will have to kick us out at a specific time in order to be able to turn it around and make it look fabulous for a gala dinner. So therefore, that's even more incentive for us to keep on time and finish um, the sessions um, as quickly as possible. However, we want to be able to have enough time to discuss these important topics. Um, one of them is something, uh, the first session is a topic that we've been discussing again and again in different forms today, um, talking about climate change and also tourism resilient ma resilience management, which as you know from my introductory comments this morning, is something which is very important uh, to our organization, uh, to the industry at large, and the person who's going to be moderating this for us is again, Mr. Ian Taylor, from Travel Weekly and my colleague. Ian, I'll let you introduce your panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniela. The last session was about beautiful destinations. This session, unfortunately, is about whether they remain beautiful uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. Um, uh, there's a fantastic panel coming up now. Um, but I'm gonna try and keep the session to 35 minutes so that you get your dinner later. So I'm not gonna labor the introductions. Please forgive me for that. Uh, would you please come up, uh, member of the European Parliament, Elena Kuntura, uh, former Minister of Tourism for Greece, uh, Minister Edmund Bartlett from Jamaica, uh, Talib Rifai, Dr. Talib Rifai, who's the chair of the ITIC and former Secretary General of the UNWTO. Welcome, Taleb. Um, oh. uh, Professor Lee Miles of uh, Bournemouth University in the UK. Welcome, Lee. And uh, Alan Chagnon, uh, President of Zoobox. Please come and join us, uh, uh, Alan. You, you, you're from Ireland, I, I think. Yeah. Welcome. We have a Welcome. Uh, okay. Um, thank you all for being uh, here. I'm going to start with the global warming aspect of this um, session on climate change and tourism uh, resilience. Um, we and I want to start with a remark that Fiona Jeffrey made this 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 morning when she said as an industry uh, we have to wake up to climate change and how the industry contributes to it the clear implication is that the industry hasn't woken up to uh, climate change and I wonder if you agree and perhaps Ele Elena we could start with you do you maybe no you weren't here when Fiona said it so I won't I won't start with you I'll come back to you uh, Minister Bartlett, has, has the industry woken up to, to climate change and what it means for the industry, both in terms of the impacts and, and in terms of travel and tourism's contribution? Well, I begin from where I sit as an island person. Um, we are hugely influenced by the action of the um, climatic events which are occurring in our space. Um, certainly in the Caribbean, we've had more intensive hurricanes, we've had more intensive seismic action. Uh, we have seen um, act activities that have been defying our own sense of how these things have been. The Caribbean has, in the last five years, 165 climatic events. We have, over the period, lost some one billion US dollars in earnings. Some 8,000 visitors have not come because of it. And we have lost 1,105 jobs. So the impact of climate change is not something which is a theoretical exercise, it's a fact. We are seeing it, we saw it um, in 2017 with Maria, um, um, which destroyed an entire island called Barbuda, 228% uh, of the GDP of Dominica, 60% of the GDP of uh, Puerto Rico, and then last year we had Dorian, which destroyed, as uh, Joy said to us earlier, 
from Abaco Island and more than 60% of um, another island which destroyed a significant portion yeah. of the tourism earnings for the area. So we recognize that it's there, so we have to respond to it. And I suspect that at a later point, I might be able to speak about the response. You might. Just to make the point that climate change is certainly a clear and present issue. Okay, Minister Bartlett has woken up to it. In the, that, that's clear. Taleb, has the industry generally woken up to it, and has it woken up to it sufficiently? I'm not sure this is w it's working. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, we've done a research and a study 10 years ago on climate change and the carbon emission that the tourism industry does, does transmit to the world. We found out that 7.5% of carbon print is produced by the travel and tourism industry. 7.5, not 20, not 30. 7.5, too many. Actually, we need to live up to that challenge. It's important to, to identify that. We are 60% of that 7.5% is produced from the transportation sector. And the rest is produced from other sectors hotels and so on. So that's, that's, the, that's the extent of our contribution. Now, are we doing enough? I don't think we're doing enough. I don't think anybody's doing enough to combat climate change. But having said this, I must react a little bit to what uh, Professor Bukhelis said in the morning, and what Fiona Jeffrey has added to. I believe in mankind. I believe that we are able to face up to that challenge. We have made it so far. I don't think we will end up with a disaster. We need to make sure that we are all up in arms against this issue. We can't allow the Trumpism and all of, all of that to, 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 to defeat us and to say that it's not a fact. It's a fact. But it's a fact that we can, we will. We will is most important. We will be able to, to face it. Because I believe in mankind. We, we've made it so far. I don't see any reason why we can't make it. So it's important to believe that we can do it. Because without that, we'll be scared. I'm a little bit against the, the, the scary policies. Scary policies are good to keep us motivated. But it's not enough. It's not good if, if they are going to let us down, and make us feel despair. We can do it. I know we can. I think travel and tourism industry is doing remarkably well. Thank you so much. OK, well, that's, that's a very helpful, optimistic view, uh, Taleb. Lee, if I, can, if I can come to you and ask you the same question, and maybe put it in the context of the remark from the speaker from the WTTC this morning, forgive me, I, I, I didn't catch her, her, her name, that not, this is referring not to travel and tourism products, but to products generally in the world. Less than 5% of global sales today are of sustainable products. We were talking about the gender gap this morning. That's a, a, a gap that dwarfs the gender gap, isn't it, if only 5%. So from that, you one would conclude that if we've only got 10 years to really get to grips with the problem, we're not going to make it. But how would you respond? Uh, three comments, firstly. Uh, just to, to put it in context of the, your disasters, I'm a disaster management specialist. Um, basically, there's three things. I, I think there's three observations in terms of the industry. First is that the impact of disasters are becoming more severe. So if we take the Caribbean now, we have in the last five years, more category four and five uh, hurricanes that have affected the majority of the region than the previous 16 years before that. So if you turn on the television, you can see in California, wildfires increasing. And the important point about that is it's the severity of the impact. The second aspect is thirdly, that largely the impact is now indiscriminate. It doesn't just affect resort or the industry, it affects what they rely upon. The actual tourist locations, the actual uh, sites, it affects the whole industry that it, uh, of which it relies on. Most of it's environmental infrastructure. It's indiscriminate. And that means it has as much implications for the local communities around the industry as it does as anything else. And part of the challenge in many ways is can the industry be seen as helping the local communities at the same time? given that it seems to be a driver, not just a solace, but of the society in which it is placed, which is the point that Taleb has made on various occasions. The third element, I would strongly say, is the frequency. And what I'm talking about here is that we are talking about, that we talk about recovering from disasters. But actually, recovering from annual flooding in West Africa, which it comes every year, or hurricane seasons where you only have nine or ten months at best to get the economies or islands back in shape or you're talking about Californian wildfires, 
that one fire can affect over 12,000 acres in itself, knock out Reagan libraries. All of those kind of elements are fundamentally important. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that I was involved in a project called Hotel Resilience, which was actually 2016, only three years ago. And that was actually looking at basically how can the industry write its own standard, treating itself in a self-contained box to protect itself and its income growth. And that's a laudable thing for the industry. But fundamentally, the agenda has moved on. The agenda moved on is the relationship to the local community is being key. Because if, they, if the industry isn't be seen to be also helping the local communities to recover, then that resilience turns into resistance and becomes fundamentally at least an unstable environment for the sport industry as a whole. So, so my point being, to answer the question made even, is that fundamentally, yes, I would say, we are increasingly facing the point that most tourist products are becoming less and less sustainable in their traditional format. And that begins to have to, in many ways, put the chin up look to the wider horizons about what the environment in which we are operating in. Okay. Alan, I'm, I'm interested in your, your, your take on it because you come from a real estate background and now uh, 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 distributes making and distributing uh, eco lodges e essentially. So you clearly recognise the, the significance of, of what's happening. But do you think there's a wider sufficient recognition in the industry? Just yeah, this is the first slide. Uh, just want to give you an uh, example of what uh, we're doing. Uh, this explains what for only from one project, the Ivory Coast, we began to work uh, on uh, six months ago. What is the real, real thing on the, the field, the problem with the climate change? At the, you can see the change, of the devastation. Uh, in uh, uh, 1975, sorry, to, to 2013. Uh, just for example, in Ivory Coast, uh, in 1960, you have uh, 16 million acres, uh, four acres, hectares of forests. Now, today, we have 2.5 million hectares of forests. What mean by, you said, Aye, why, the climate change, they cut the trees. And that, it, it's not a, the problem is, when you cut a lot of forests like that, uh, you, pr you, uh, you have a problem because the rain go d going down, because you have not less humidity in the air. And after that, you, the, the, the weather, the temperature is higher. And put with the, 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 the global warming, put the thing together, and the result is very huge. And can, yes, if you see in the in the map on the map, you can see Ivory Coast, and only one place is green right now. And this place, that the place we're working on actually is the national park, the Thai national park. Each year at this place. Around 10,000 hectares are cut in the forest. And the authorities with the ecotourist business and economy think that we can have uh, save 1,000 1, hectares by year in the forest. That represents a huge, huge thing. And you say, oh, well, how can we do, do that? that it's very easy because the travelers when you come outside you need a lot of support you need a lot of employees and it's a represent around 150 some jobs in the community a vulnerable a vulnerable population and this population never they, uh, they stop to cut to to agriculture they stop to 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 have uh, cattle to to put fire in the forest and it's a big change. You think 1,000 hectares for only one park in Ivory Coast by year. It represents around $3 million US in carbon uh, market. That's the change we can see. It's, it's each project we work in. Okay, Eleanor, you've been very patient given I went to you first. How, how do you respond? You, you know, you've had experience as a tourism minister in Greece, dealing with partners in the industry and, and so on, and developers and so on. Do you think the industry has, has 
got the significance of climate change, both its contribution and its impact, sufficiently? Okay. First of all, we have to think that we're not speaking anymore about climate change. We speak about climate emergency mm. and cli cr climate crisis. So uh, my opinion is that because we face this uh, systemic, uh, in order to address um, and, and, uh, and confront all these problems, we need uh, to change fundamental the society and the mindset. Because we have to change the way we travel and the way we live. And uh, in that direction, as a Minister of Tourism in Greece, all of you know that uh, the time that I was there from the 2015 to 2000, uh, 2019, we faced a lot of refugee issues, a lot of um, uh, in Europe security issues. We faced also extreme weather conditions. And we actually um, uh, tried to find solutions individual, like a, as a country with our uh, policy that uh, in our case was successful, in other cases they were not. Now, from my new position as a member of the European Parliament, I'm trying to find a way to support the um, countries uh, and uh, let's say add more tools to be able to do different strategy, better strategy for sustainability, for sustainable growth, and at the same time to protect the sector with three ways. The first thing, um, on the sad occasion of the bankruptcy of Thomas Cook, we had a res um, resolution for Thomas Cook. And there we introduced uh, to the European Commission from the European Parliament that we need to have a European mechanism, not individual actions, but uh, a global strategy. We also said that it's important to tourism to be included in the budget of 21, uh, 27, the, the next uh, funding budget for sustainability and for also be able to uh, manage uh, as uh, a united policy problems like this. And the third thing is that in European Parliament, our committee called TRAN is transportation and tourism, but in the, the, co the commissioner uh, is not related to transportation and tourism, it's related only to uh, transportation. So we ask the portfolio to be the same so we can uh, be able to work both issues because when you travel, you use transportation. And to, uh, in order to travel and be a tourist and uh, be able to keep the sustainability we need in all this sector, everything is related. So um, I think we have to uh, use also all the tools that we have. And at the same time, I think that we have to separate uh, the uh, governmental policies for um, sustainability and growth, because as you know, most of the countries that we are here and some more, uh, we live from tourism. Even Europe is the first global destination with 10% of the GDP. So. For, for some uh, countries, uh, the national economy depends from tourism. So there are two different things to protect the economy, the jobs, because tourism creates thousands of jobs, millions of jobs. And the next thing is the stakeholders and the business. So the sustainability and the resilience should come from both ways and everybody should be responsible from their side. So as a Minister of Tourism of Greece, I was working in a different field and I was fighting for, let's say, different things. As a member of the European Parliament, I'm fighting for all the member states and from the common European uh, policy and mechanism. And I think it will work because right now they take us serious 
and I'm closing my speech with this, Mr. Taleb Rifai always used to tell me that um, in order to make us serious, they have to see the travel economy, how big it is, and understand that uh, we need to uh, have a sustainable growth. Countries, stakeholders, and policies for creating jobs and also protect uh, local destinations and especially uh, insularity because uh, my friend here is coming from an island, but Greece also has, it's like a, a, a Polynesian country, has uh, hundreds of islands in Europe. So there are so many issues to think about it, and we have to change the way of we think, mindset, and also um, make changes uh, in our uh, policies. Okay, uh, two quick questions to follow up what you've just said, if I may. You mentioned Thomas Cook as yes. an example of something you can have a pan-European uh, approach to rather than a country-by-country -country approach. But the EU spent 20 years or more drafting the new package travel regulations, which yes. came in in 2016, which were supposed to harmonize responses to a company failure like Thomas Cook. And what's clear is that the responses were, were different because the, the regulations were implemented in different ways across the EU. So my question is, if it takes that long to get something that doesn't work properly when a company fails, what hope is there of addressing climate change by harmonizing the response across the EU? Because we don't have the le that much time to, to deal with it, do we? So that, that's why you have to insist and we have to push. Right now, for example, in the European Parliament, we try to get uh, these two things together, like transportation and uh, tourism, because the legislation will, hap will help not only the consumers' rights, but also the worker rights. And at the same time, don't forget that it's not only Thomas Cook. Last year and the years before, there were bankruptcies of other tour operators, of airlines, and all these things okay. we have to... Okay. I, I don't want us to take us off to a discussion of, yeah. of, of bankruptcies, but it, it just as an illustration the, the of the difficulties that, in, but in if, addressing. If these things are happening, we have to uh, confront them because the thing is that the local communities, they suffer. Yeah. So it's important. Okay, and just a, f a final thing, uh, quickly. You, you said that your approach had changed from when you were a tourism minister to now being an MEP. Has your view of, of the issues changed? and therefore how to address them because you take a wider view now. Because as a tourism minister, what, whatever your perception of climate change and its impacts and so on, you're still compelled to talk about jobs and numbers and growth and, and so on, aren't you? Well, the thing is, as a, a minister of tourism, I was focused for my country and the needs of my country and it, their individual needs and their different needs. Now, as a member of the European Parliament, in order to help my country and all the countries that they live from tourism and they have high in their agenda uh, all the benefits that tourism brings, like, for example, uh, tourism can fight uh, unemployment. It's important. Tourism can really, it's the key sector that uh, also in the bridge that drive to uh, other sectors to growth. And, 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 and it's important to see how from um, how we're going to have a united, let's say, uh, strategy and policy for tourism and travel so we can help all the countries, member states. So it's a different approach. Okay, very good. Uh, Minister Bartlett, can I come back, back to you? And you mentioned already the re responses to the uh, increasing number of extreme weather events and so on and the future impacts we can expect from from climate change. So you've established this uh, Global Resilience Center in, in, in Jamaica. Tell us what you hope to uh, achieve with that, and, and because it's open now, isn't it, and functioning? Yeah, thank you. Um, the whole purpose here is to be able to assist all of us who are highly tourism dependent countries, but are also highly vulnerable to not just um, climatic events or seismic events, but global disruption of various types, whether it be um, terrorism or it be pandemic or it be um, economic and cyber uh, attacks and cyber crimes 
or it's even what we provide as politicians, which is this political disruption. Okay, so what really is needed is a mechanism, is an institutional support mechanism to provide systems in building capacity to deal with these disruptions when they come. Um, in our instance, is to be able to track these disruptions, to, to be able to mitigate, to, to then be able to manage the disruptions when they arrive in your space, and then to recover, and then to recover quickly, because time is of essence, and it means jobs, it means economic well-being, it means instability. So we have to recover, recover quickly, and then thrive. And the problem of thriving is perhaps the most significant of all. Haiti had an earthquake 12 years ago. It was registered 10 on the Richter scale. It destroyed much of Haiti. Haiti had been pushed back 50 years in terms of its economic development. And it has not recovered and cannot recover. So the impact of all of this bears heavily on us. And therefore, we needed somewhere where there would be now a repository of data, information, best practices, communication support, so that we could be able to identify where the problems are and be specific about it and to be on messaging so that the world can understand how to assist the recovery process in these areas, especially those that are highly vulnerable. So the establishment of the Global Tourism Resilience and Crisis Management Center is an attempt to respond to this. And we have been very fortunate, I think, in that we are positioned in academia. So we are benefiting from research that is provided from the academic institutions. And then we are getting responses also from the private sector in terms of that partnership to provide resource support. And to the point that uh, response we made to the Bahamas situation, where we were able to provide 100,000 US dollars from the center and the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association to do a baseline study of resilience capacity within the Caribbean area. And this is very important to us because it now gives us an opportunity to be able to provide information and data to guide countries in building resilience in the various areas. And so we, we, we want to take that now beyond the Caribbean. And um, the, the, our Kenyan brothers and I, uh, have been having discussions with us. We're establishing a satellite center there at the Kenyatta University um, in December. And we're going to a number of other places. We've been to Malta. We're doing a similar situation. We've been to Nepal. We're doing another situation there. And we continue to move around so as to build these institutional support mechanism within academia to begin with, so that we can benefit from research and from constant uh, rigor, academic rigor, and getting the best that can be provided to assist our communities in firstly, tracking, secondly, responding, thirdly, recovering, and fourthly, thrive after recovery. Okay, thank you for that. Let, in that case, let's go to a, an, an academic. Lee, you've got a future-proof job title, haven't you, in crisis, Professor of Crisis and Resilience uh, Management. The, the, what resilience management means differs in different contexts, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Ex explain that. I think there's three points I'd like to make. The first point is just to <coughs> reiterate a little bit what the Minister was saying. And actually, it comes from what the Minister from Sierra Leone is saying already, is that actually often industry or, or tourism and also in disaster management is a, a first world western orientated uh, product that's being developed so we are developing models which are therefore to apply to the rest of the world but the developing world in the caribbean and in africa are in the front line of current crisis emergencies and they have a lot of experience on the ground how to deal with these on an annual or yearly basis and one of the challenges is affecting to make sure that voice is heard as part of the agenda setting. And I was very encouraged by having a conference here which has such a large African representation within it. But one of the points uh, to allude to is that basically when we talk about resilience, resilience is effectively from a term like innovation was 10 years ago. It's been stretched to become everything to all people. 
And I think actually what, what the challenge, if you like, from the academic perspective, is actually to, to go back to the title that's behind us. The focus on the agenda setting must be on Africa, small islands, and emerging markets, because they are at the front line of the crisis emergency. And they have effectively many of the hand-on solutions on the ground, which systems are slowing and incorporating. First point. The second point, however, I would say is that basically there's a challenge because in the discussion that goes on within the industry, it's often the notion of sustainable tourism and the notion of how tourism contributes to wider sustainability gets mixed. And the challenge really is firstly for the, the industry to uh, really decide what it means by resilience in terms of its contribution to maintaining that tourism is sustainable in all parts of the world, in a, in a factor where you face continu continuous crisis emergencies. And the second point is that basically, what is the contribution of tourism to the wider sustainability of local communities and of the wider agenda, which goes back to the sustainable development goals. And my, my, my challenge or my plea would be effectively that the academic world has started to see those two things as two different things. And really, there's a need to connect through the centers and through new agendas in the industry about how you practically operate that. So when we're talking about new centers and new developments in Zanzibar, to what extent are those two issues of how we practically deliver sustainable tourism and how tourism contributes to sustainable um, uh, wider sustainability should be at the core of every strategic move that we make. Okay, very good. Taleb, can I come to you and by all means respond to, to any of those remarks if you want to, but I wanted to ask you whether you think that investors' decisions are being affected by the climate emergency that uh, Elena re referred to and by the impacts we're, we're already seeing. So the, do they look at island nations, coastal resorts and so on and see, well, what, what is, what is the sea level going to be by the, by the time uh, I, I see a full return on my investment and so on? Is, are you aware of investors making those decisions? We heard from James Noel this morning who said, you know, we've got 10 years and yet we're invested to act, but, but we're investing for 20 and, and, and 30 years. Yes, I think they are. I think we're underestimating the intelligence of these investors. But what I want to say is connected to what you just heard here. It's sust what is sustainability after all? Sustainability is to sustain life on Earth. It's not just about the environment. It's about how we continue to live together as human beings. Because if we don't, I mean, sustainability is not about not touching things, using things as they are. That's not sustainability. It's not about, it's not anti-progress or anti-growth. If we don't progress, we regress. And if we regress, life on Earth will stop. That's not sustainability. We need to keep moving. We need to have faith in ourselves. Keep moving forward. We need to grow. But we need to grow in a sustainable way. We need to progress in a sustainable way. That's, that's it. So that's why investors have a responsibility in doing that. Now, I would focus more on the issue of, of society and people. Because after all, we, we want to save this planet for people. People are more important than anything else. The world can live without people, but people cannot live without this world. So it's the people that are the focus of everything. And what, what, uh, what's being said here is very, very important. Because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the investor is quite aware of, of the surrounding local community and how it connects to them. We're having many, many investments. I was a bit worried today, but I was not so worried after I spoke to the gentleman from Zanzibar about trying to build a city within a city. The higher the walls are between the local community and the visiting community, the more damaging things we do. We need to open up. We need to make sure every, every investor is aware that unless he or she, the investment, connects itself to the local community, their investment itself would not be sustainable. You know, we have, we have many examples of developing countries where people, uh, visiting community, is seen as, as if they're coming from Mars. We look at them as the rich people coming to exploit our lands. That's, that's not acceptable anymore. That's, to me, a much more serious issue than any other issue. We need to make sure that every investment connects itself to the local community by making its business, sharing its business, not just its profit. What we have is, is, a, is an act where the corporate social responsibility just all about paying money. You, you pay money to the community, it's on your share. No. What you need to do is share your business. You need to buy from them. You need to make sure that every visitor to your, your resort 
coming to them. Take people to the community, not bring the community to you. That's the most important part of this. Thank you. Okay, you, you put the case eloquently, uh, Taleb, but to, in, 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 to try and wrap this up because we have to come to a close, I want to come back to the remark that Susanna made uh, a bit earlier this afternoon. Who, and Susanna teaches sustainable tourism and has done for 20 years. And she said the agenda of sustainability in hotels has barely changed in the period that she's been uh, teaching. Now, if, that, if, if, if that's wholly true, we really have got a big problem, haven't we? So I wonder, do you agree with Susanna or would you challenge uh, uh, th that remark? Elena? Well, I agree with Susanna and I agree with Taleb. <laughs> what does it mean? That uh, we need uh, to invest uh, in innovation, education, awareness. And I think uh, because we are all in this together, and tourism always was about people and always will be about people and their well-being. So in that case, of course, uh, the communities and the mindset has to be changed fundamental for be sustainability in both ways. And the truth is there is a little bit uh, delay. I mean, it's not going as fast as should. But I think now that is not a climate change, but a climate emergency, everybody will move faster, I think. Okay, uh, everyone will have to be fairly quick. Uh, Taleb, did you want to come next and then, yes. and then you, Minister? I agree with Susanna. I think the tourism industry has been a very traditionally slow-moving industry in many of its aspects. Just think about it. We were able to put a man on the moon before we were able to put two wheels on a suitcase. That's <laughs> <laughs> how traditional we are. But having said this, it doesn't mean that we can't do it. Now, it's not about tourism only. You know, I've spent half of my life working in tourism. But I don't care. I don't give a damn about tourism. What I, give it, what I care about is what does tourism do to people and to the lives of people. We need to connect with other industries. We need to connect with other sectors. And the other sectors are doing much about climate change and are doing much about uh, emergencies. They really are. But yes, I agree, Susanna. I think the tourism industry per se, classical tourism industry, is not moving enough. With the, with the rhythm of time. Hotels are still being managed the same way they were managed 500 years ago. You still go to the reception desk, you have to fill in a paper, you have to show your passport, you have to, I don't, I don't need to go much, much deeper. But the tourism industry needs to wake up. Okay. That wants to be part of the solution. Okay, tell us. Just so one minute each now, please, I'm sorry. Just Minister. add quickly to say that what we need to do is to, to develop the ambition to invest in resilience and in invest in sustainability. Um, the tourism industry is not seeing that as part of the DNA of the industry, You're not seeing it as part of the bottom line. They are seeing it more as part of social corporate responsibility, but in terms of humanitarian responses. We have to see this as an important part of survival and a critical part of the DNA of tourism over time. Alain. I think uh, we have a, we have a, a big uh, concern here. We, have, we, have, we need to work together uh, to realize uh, this goal. It's not the easy thing. Uh, but when uh, we begin in 2003, uh, when we discuss about sustainable and ecotourism, everybody said, what is that? Now, everybody knows what, what is that. The resilience is the same thing. I think we discuss, and all the people here are very uh, ready to move, and uh, that's, that's good news. Okay, a final word to Lee. Uh, two points. Firstly, I think in terms of, you mentioned the clash, I think there's a clash between effectively short-term investment opportunity and long-term investments. And uh, actually, how do we invest when we're facing crisis and emergencies? That's the fundamental point. And I think actually that the financial markets, and certainly the World Bank, is moving in that direction already. That investment will be conditional upon having plans that are sustainable beyond short-term crisis emergencies. Otherwise, we are faced with a very simple point, that some tourism locations will no longer be tourism locations. They will either be knee-deep in water or fundamentally they will just disappear into the oceans. So, and the Caribbean is probably at the front line of that. So in a sense, I think the investment markets will, as, will be at the forefront of driving the, the actual resilience agenda in, in, in terms of investment. 
The second point I would make, however, is actually we went back to the point about hotels. And hotels effectively uh, really tailor for a market. And that market has essentially been, you know, the consumer. And the consumer is becoming more sophisticated. And crisis emergencies will lead to behavioral change. And behavioral change is probably the way that the industry, the hotel sector, will largely move. It may be in a passive way, but one suspects that's, that's going to move forward increasingly. Because we are moving, we made the point right from the start, we start with climatic change, we're moving, we are in a crisis emergency, and we are very, very close to tipping points. And tipping points are fundamentally about behavioural change. And if the tourist industry is to be the generator of growth at its been, and we look forward to, in terms of the, 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 uh, the, the uh, developing economies in particular, then that becomes fundamentally important for the way we think about resilience. Resilience is effectively a change of mind of behavioural sets, and that affects both consumers, financial markets, and the industry itself. The challenge is effectively how you link those agendas together so that everybody is working towards the same goal, a more resilient, effective ecosystem. Very good. Well, look, it does beg the question, when comes the tipping point and when comes the behavioural change? But let's leave that for now. And please thank Eleanor, Minister Bartlett, Talib, <laughs> Lee, and Alan. Okay, and thank you, Ian, for moving that along very effectively and worked very well. Um, okay, uh, the next, um, the penultimate presentation is on the importance of effective branding to add value to the national tourism product. Um, this is uh, something that, again, is absolutely fundamental for d successful destination growth and planning. And I'm very happy to invite Mr. Ben Locke, Senior Director for Edelman, onto the stage to share his thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I appreciate that we're fast running out of time, so I've tried to cut what I was going to say in half. So that's what I'm going to endeavour to do. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Ben Locke, and I run the International Affairs Programme at Edelman. We deal with um, uh, reputational issues for governments and corporates, but do a lot of FDI, tourism, and branding campaigns. So listen, um, country branding is nothing new, nation branding. As many of you know, it, it's been around for 20 years or so. In essence, it means applying the corporate practice of brand strategy to, and other marketing disciplines to the political and ec economic development of a destination. But what has changed is how ubiquitous it is today. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's incredibly competitive today, as you all know, and the world is changing. Global perceptions of certain countries that have historically been stable have altered dramatically in recent years because of recent events. So countries are increasingly recognizing the need to push forward a coordinated and consistent positive message to enhance their interests. But the problem remains that nation branding is a concept that is intangible, it's esoteric. And because it is so nebulous, a lot of people misunderstand the concept and a lot of people don't like the concept. It's a much maligned phrase. But why is that? Well, people take exception to the idea that, that a country's reputation or a region's reputation can be spun by people who practice the dark arts of PR like myself. People also take issue with the concept that there may be shortcuts for a government to achieve greater international standing despite any reputational issues they may have. Moreover, many people believe that you cannot brand something so multifaceted, so complex as an entire country in such a reductive way. But to its proponents, it's a necessity of the modern age. In this connected and globalized, yet increasingly polarized world, Position your country in the best way possible in the world system is essential to improve international influence, to foster international relations, increase trade, create jobs, stability and wealth, and so on. What is clear is that it's an enormously complicated and time-intensive process, and the very few people have done it well. Why is that? Well, probably because the image of a country is so complicated and so fluid that it, it, that it makes it inherently impossible to get the clarity implied by the word brand. What is more manageable and what is more measurable, of course, is tourism. And for the purpose of today, it's important that um, 
we distinguish between a nation brand uh, and a national tourism brand. Yes, they are symbiotic. Yes, they feed into each other and support each other. But a tourism brand cannot be relied to do all the work, quite frankly. It's too narrow in its reach. So what is a national tourism brand? Is it something that encapsulates, encapsulates a place's personality, a particular worldview, a, wa a way of life, a culture? Does it explain the things that make up the very bloodstream of a particular place? Well, yes, it's all of those things, but it's worth dwelling a little bit on the word brand to help us understand what we mean. The concept of brands and branding obviously has changed a lot in, in, in the last, I'd say, 50 years. Long ago, it ceased be being merely just about objects. The dynamic has evolved so that people now have relationships to a brand, a relationship based on mutual expectations and mutual understanding. So a successful brand is one that not only has widespread appeal, but allows each individual consumer to experience the brand in his or her own unique way. In fact, consumers use brands to reflect their actual and their ideal selves. So applying that context of national tourism branding means not just answering the fundamental question, why should I come to your country? It means more specifically, tell me why your country is relevant to what I aspire to be. And it is that aspirational quality that the most successful tourism brands convey. Not easy to achieve, of course. So what are the steps to developing a successful national tourism brand? Well, the critical first step is to uncover the insight. You need to understand what makes a place tick. You need to identify the character and the spirit um, of a place. You also need to understand how it is portrayed and how it is viewed by your target audience. But most importantly, you need to understand what makes your audience tick and what the relationship that you are trying to establish between your brand and your audience. Only by answering, those, by answering those questions can you really understand what the challenge is and what the solution is. That consumer insight is critical to developing a strategy and tactics of a successful branding campaign. Then comes the narrative development, taking that an analysis and that insight. What is the story you're trying to tell and how is it going to, be, going to land with the people you want to engage? In these most competitive of days, when so many countries are vying for a share of the tourism market, it's almost depressing how similar narratives are nowadays. What are the differentiators? What are the most compelling reasons why I should come to your country? How can you help me be who I want to be and who I think I am? Whether that be adventurous, cultured, cosmopolitan, curious, romantic, whatever it may be. The answer is not just things like climate or cuisine or culture. To borrow from the HR industry, those things are hygiene factors, i.e. they're the things that are almost expected. The real answer is a narrative that taps into the trends that I care about, be it wellness, experience, adventure, a narrative that gives a unique personality. What are the passions and perspectives of the people that I am going to interact with in your country? And increasingly, how can you help me travel with intention and make mindful choices about where I go and how I spend my money in order to fulfill a, mo a more meaningful purpose? The third stage before going to market is you need to get internal validation. And that's not internal validation within your organization, that means within your country. Paradoxically, paradoxically the most important audience for a national tourism brand is the people of that country. It will only succeed if the people are inspired, enthused, and happy, happy to be behind that brand. You need them to be advocates for your brand. A brand that promises to deliver social, cultural, and economic benefits for the local populace will, will obviously more likely succeed but it needs to be non-political and it needs to be all-inclusive. Look at the way countries like Chile have sensitized its citizens to become global ambassadors around its tourism brand. But on the other hand, for those of us who remember it back in the 90s, when the Labour Party in the UK tried to rebrand the country called Britannia, it was an abject failure. It failed because it didn't have the people's support and it didn't represent what the people wanted to be known for. So getting internal buy-in is, is, is also an exercise in managing expectations of your core stakeholders. Branding is an abstract concept. Operators are skeptical because they want to see immediate impact on their business. It's hard for people to understand the brand value. To overcome skepticism, people need to understand that the rewards of branding take time. And finally, is the, final, is the communication stage. How to communicate that brand. And as a PR guy, this is something that I feel particularly passionate about. There are some fundamental things that need to get right. First of all, tourism brands need to be much, much more than just a logo or a strap line. There needs to be a strong storyline running through a campaign. Any digital campaign, and we, we saw some incredible digital campaigns earlier on, any digital campaign needs to be based on the understanding of talking with 
rather than at your audience. That means true engagement and something dealing, and sometimes that means dealing with fairly uncomfortable issues. Dubai has actually done it very well, in my opinion. They produce videos with animated overlays that bring their content to life. And, and actually, surprisingly, they, they are good at replying to comments and mentions on Instagram and Facebook, and they often post content created by their followers or collaborators. So your campaign needs to have an armory of compelling content, but most of all, it needs to be based around storytelling. Personality, not just glossy photos. The experience economy, frankly, demands it. Look at what India Tourism did by using immersive, authentic, highly visual storytelling. Look at what Buenos Aires did in bringing together locals' perspectives on, on to discover the unique features of 20 different parts of that city to tell unexpected versions of a city that the world thought they already knew. That's exactly the kind of compelling storytelling that re resonates. And increasingly, technology is key. Look at what uh, Discover Hong Kong used recently with virtual reality to experience what the city was like back in the 60s and 80s, bringing to life its narrative around its history and its evolution. So getting those four stages right, the research analysis, the powerful narrative, the internal advocacy, and the strategic communications program, and you are on track, but a crucial question remains. How do you evaluate and measure what is a significant investment? Well, there are numerous country, branding, uh, country rankings and indices that exist, as we all know, whether it be the relative strength of a brand, the economic and social impact of that brand, the digital rankings, and so on. There are also measurements of livability, of ease of doing business. But I repeat from earlier, I want to distinguish between country branding and national tourism branding. So the return on investment in, 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 in tourism is obviously uh, hard to, uh, to, to measure overnight. This is a process that requires time um, as well as commercial investment. Therefore, it's important to measure whether you are on the right track from the outset. That's why I would recommend a holistic measurement, not only demonstrating how we shift media and social attention and conversations, but also leveraging primary research, advanced analytics, data modeling, to map the way to continuous improvement and optimization. That also means having a place of measurement framework that can truly demonstrate the impact and value a tourism brand is having. In essence, it should qualify three areas. Attention, what is the awareness of the campaign? Attitude, are we changing attitudes and opinions with, the, with our brand communications? And action, has the campaign driven behavior changes? That doesn't just mean sales, that means endorsements and engagement. So what I've hopefully conveyed today is that the value of national tourism branding can deliver results, and this is how to best deliver it and how best to, to measure it. But we live in fast evolving times, and I, and I wanted to end today by speculating a little on the future. With the Western world seeing a real crisis of leadership on both sides of the Atlantic, the developing world is catching up. Middle Eastern, Asian, African, Latin American nation brands are fast becoming real challenger brands to the old guards, the old giants. And as many of you no doubt will be extremely aware, demographic changes, evolving needs, new technologies, these will change the landscape of tourism over the coming years. So we could spend hours speculating on what that means for country branding, but I wanted to focus on three trends that are worth considering uh, for future national uh, tourism campaigns. Firstly, people are increasingly turning to travel as a way to make positive personal Im impact with their time and their money. People want to travel with a greater sense of purpose. They want to go somewhere and make a difference. This could mean choosing a specific destination because there's a timely need to support that local community, or simply choosing a specific tour or cruise or hotel or product that where their dollars will go to support certain values or causes. The 2019 Edelman Earned Brand Study that we published revealed that nearly two-thirds of consumers around the world now, now buy on belief, a remarkable increase of 13 points from the previous year. Those belief-driven buyers will choose, switch, avoid, or boycott a brand based on where it stands and the political or social issues they care about. This is the trend that should have enormous impact on how national tourism brands are developed, marketed, and measured. Secondly, people are increasingly becoming more interested in specific areas or parts of cities nowadays. Look at London or New York. You are literally a tube stop away from not only a very different brand proposition, but increasingly competitive propositions. Looking ahead, more and more smaller localities around the world will, will develop their own tourism identities. And thirdly, the response to over-tourism. With more people traveling international for the first time, many of them are heading to the destinations that have been popular for generations. 
which is why cities like Barcelona, Venice, Paris, Amsterdam are straining to support the masses. They're also starting to crack down and impose limitations. The rising popularity of Insta Instagram is obviously not helping. A study revealed that 40% of millennials will choose a holiday destination based on how Instagrammable it is compared to the weather or value for money. So what does this mean for nation branding, for, for tourism branding? Well, destination marketing organizations have a responsibility for storytelling in underserved areas, and tour operators have a responsibility to develop products that take guests out of the city centers and into those underserved areas. From a comms perspective, it's notable that increasing, increasingly media are playing their part. Earlier this year, the New York Times did their uh, 50 places, must-go places for the year. And they included Uzbekistan, Panama, Slovakia, multiple African nations, all places with developing tourism industries, but no issues of crowds. Over-tourism is, is a complicated problem. So watch for a variety of creative solutions to address them, from a new emphasis on the quiet, quiet season to campaigns that discourage specific geotaggings in sensitive environmental areas. But under-tourism also under-tourism, by the way, being the response to over-tourism, under-tourism also presents an ideal opportunity for less known cities and rural destinations. So also look for some nations and regions to begin marketing, marketing their own, their lack of crowds as an asset. In short, the marketplace is getting more competitive. So there is a lot that is changing in the arena of, of national tourism branding. Some changes present challenges, some provide opportunities, but done well, done strategically with internal support and advocacy and with the communications machinery in place, the rewards are clear. A successful brand will embody and represent the diverse positive elements that compromise a nation, but more importantly, it will present an emotional connection with your audience and provide a compelling reason for them to come to your country. However, it's no small undertaking. It requires proper commitment, it requires proper resource and patience, but increasingly, it's no longer a nice to have. It's a necessity in the modern age. Thank you. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the final session of the day, okay? And um, uh, Minister Bartlett asked this earlier on about uh, training and retention and what we're gonna do in to keep people in our industry and keep them engaged and motivated. And I'm going to invite Professor Dimitris Buhalis, who we've met before today, to come and talk about how we're going to address this crucial problem and to introduce his panelists. Thank you very much. last session just before um, we go for dinner. Can I have uh, Susanna, Catherine, Nigel, Andrew, and actually Jan up here as well? Okay, I took the liberty of inviting one of my students, uh, Jan Lee, uh, to the panel, because quite often we're talking about education, and you take my seat just in the middle, Jan. Okay, I'll, I'll come. Come there. Um, we are all always talking about education and students and what they're learning, but actually we don't give them the voice. We all the old guys coming along and they are talking about them and what's their future. But in fact, we need to start realizing that it is um, their future and it's their life. And we should be serving them rather than them serving us. Um, and I also took the liberty of not telling anything to my panel. And Susanna was kind of panicking early on, said, what should I do to prepare? I said, nothing, you've prepared enough. You've done so much stuff over the years that you can, um, that you can do great things. Now, of course, we have been given the last session and we should have finished long ago. I'll take the liberty to go up to 6.15 until, any, until anybody is shooting me and saying, no, you, you should stop here and, and now. Now, um, for those of you who know me, um, I've spent the last two or three years in Bournemouth University modernizing our degrees and changing everything we're doing with a 2030 vision, meaning that we need to prepare our students to be ready for 2030. And they need to be 2030 because the students who came in in 2019, they'll graduate in 2023, 
and six or seven years later, they should be in managerial positions, and therefore, they should be leading the industry in the future. So I've got a horizon of 2030, and I really want to see how we can use tourism education to produce the managers who are going to take us to the next 10 years. So if I can start with Susanna and say, what do you think the managers of 2030 should look like and what education should we give them now to actually get us to that point? Yeah? No robot? This is number, th number three. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think one of the main things is they are flexible. Um, they certainly have not edu been educated to their one and only profession. They are prepared for several educational circles in their lives. Um, the multidisciplinary, I would uh, assume, they have the skills to research information and be critical about it. And, um, well, human connection is very important, I think, in this. Empathy. And empathy. So we need to teach them empathy. Yeah. So I think um, there's no one subject that we need to ex exactly teach. It's, it's more these competencies that are needed, which we need to encourage and sort of dig out of the students. Thank you. Jan, as a student, we, we turn the table around. What would you like to be by 2030? Why are you doing a master's? Why did you leave a career in China to do the master's in Bournemouth? Oh, it's a very complicated question to me. Uh, actually, I already have 16 years work experience in tourism in China, 10 years to uh, did the inbound tour in China and uh, Five years ago, I started to do my own travel business. And uh, <coughs> for the past uh, 16 years, uh, more chances, more opportunities come to me. I feel more tough, uh, I mean, more challenged, uh, because there are so many opportunities there. Are everybody talking about uh, big data, uh, uh, online uh, tourism. Everything in China is uh, booming, especially after 2008 the outbound China travel, uh, travel business, but um, lots of um, uh, challenge, challenge, challenge is my ability, I thought, couldn't support my uh, strategies or couldn't support myself to get more markets, more business. And uh, I graduated 16 years ago for, uh, to finish my BA in China, and during that years, uh, probably I was the second, um, how to say, the second year uh, we have the tourism management uh, major in China University, most of the universities. And during that time, we learned the uh, uh, tourism uh, theories uh, from Thomas Cook. But the, the day when I arrived here, Thomas Cook, yeah, have some new stories. Okay, so when I especially when I start to do my own business, I found um, it's really hard to find uh, qualified employees to well understand um, uh, our target and uh, couldn't f uh, offer the qualified services, uh, both in outbound travel business or inbound. And even for myself, um, I, I found uh, I couldn't understand well enough the whole world. So, so it's knowledge and tools. Yeah, and I have to improve my mind, everything. Not only the English, not only the language barrier, it's also about the culture, uh, both outbound and inbound. So the global element. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Andrew, from the Malta point of view, you are kind of involved in a lot of different things in the destination. What does the destination want to help? What do they... I mean, we don't have a lot of people coming to us at the university and say, you know what, we are thinking long term, 10 years time. In 10 years time, we should be doing this. I'm now getting a lot of Saudi Arabia universities and 
uh, coming to us and say, we are open up and we need to train one million employees to be able to serve um, the, um, the industry. Can you help us develop that kind of thing? So from a destination point of view, what do you think that universities and education should actually provide to um, the new talent that's going to come in the industry? As you rightly mentioned, first of all, one needs to understand vision. I mean, we live in a world where we have to look ahead. And this, from my experience, as, as you will know, I work not just in Malta, but across the Mediterranean region, I find it really missing. When you start talking about vision, about where you want to get to, people just get confused because we seem to be producing people, managers, who just are fantastic to manage the status quo. And so this is something where we need to talk more about, uh, talk about vision and thinking outside the box. Thinking different because we're living in times, dynamic times as we're experiencing. Um, so here you're talking about robots, technology. Technology is amazing. It's something which enhances the experience. And tourism today is all about experience. If we don't understand, if, if our future managers, or I would say, today's managers, tomorrow's managers in the tourism sector do not understand to, um, uh, technology, we're going to be missing a lot. Um, so our universities and sometimes universities are a bit bureaucratic to catch up with the latest. Um, we're going to miss a lot um, uh, on implementing the visions of setting our countries as important destinations. And, uh, and this leads me to also the philosophical side. We, given that more people now are traveling from different parts of the world, there is people like Malta, we have three, four main markets, um, um, UK, Italy, Germany. Today, we're having people coming from all over the world. So even the type of visitor who's visiting our country, or our destination, the region in the Mediterranean, they're diverse. And to satisfy them, to give them the experience that we all talk about, we need to understand the way they think the way how they think. So diversity, global approach, and future proving. Absolutely. Understanding what the, the future requires and provide the young people with the tools and the, like Jan was saying early on, do I know what I need in order to, to do a good job? And actually, I have to tell you that um, we really need to do a better job with the des destinations, and the industry coming closer to the universities. And I'll tell you what we're doing in Bomog University to actually do that. Um, we, go to, um, we go to Nigel, and Nigel uh, had a background on tour operating. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and then now uh, you're a consultant. So you are obviously working with industry. And what I find quite often in industry is that they need, they need solutions for tomorrow. And it's a short-term kind of thing they are not necessarily uh, looking into a long-term engagement and, and take education. They need more training rather than education. Am I right? The short answer is yes. yes. And, and it's great to actually be finally sitting on stage talking about people. Because with all that we talked about today, investment in sustainable tourism for these markets, you need the right people to do the right job. Absolutely. You need to touching on the answer to the question you asked directly, future managers need to understand not only their business, <coughs> they need to be multi-skilled and multifaceted in all aspects of business. I deal particularly with, with SMEs, so business owners in developing countries. And the one thing they scream at me that they need desperately is help. They need coaching continually, even as a business owner. But what they want that help for is to be able to grow and to empower other people they hope to employ in the future. And they then need the ability to be able to empower those people to help grow their business on their behalf. So without the ability to deal with people, very few businesses will be that successful. Of course we need technology, but people ultimately buy people and they depend on people to deliver their products and services. Management, marketing, communication with customers. Absolutely. People to people in all levels, in all different. Abs and certainly in the markets we're talking about today, people are looking to go to these markets for, amongst other things, a cultural experience. And culture means people. Absolutely. You, so you need those people to deliver that product and that service for you. 
in a I very professional and consistent way. Absolutely. I keep thinking that the tourism people were actually the interface between different cultures. I just came back from China, and my Chinese students were kind of following me up on WeChat and what I was doing, and it was really interpreting um, Western world to China and Chinese world to Western. So we are in that kind of people industry where we explain each other. Okay. We are with a UNTO report recently said that one in 10 jobs in the world is a travel and tourism related job. And if you look at some of these developing markets, one person employed can feed their family and their greater extended family, 10 to 15 people. So travel and tourism can be an extremely good force for good, but it needs to trickle down and people that provide those services need to be rewarded for providing those services. Absolutely. One in 10 is in, uh, on average. When you're looking to Malta, when you're looking at the Greek islands, when you're looking in some places in Thailand, when you're looking to some place in Australia, when you're looking to some place in Finland, 56% of, of, of the population depends on tourism. So although it's one in 10, so in London it's probably gonna be one in four, but if you're going in, in, in Malta, it's probably one in, uh, one in six or something, you know, um, and things like that. So in some areas it's much more important than others. Thank you. I left Catherine to the end because she's a good friend of mine and we're going around the world and we're saying uh, great things. And um, Catherine, coming from Malaysia, Australia, um, been in New Zealand for a long time, she's got a, a global kind of perspective on those things. And um, she's leading in, in education in, in Griffith University in Australia. So how do you see, from a global perspective, what do we need to do in order to take these things forward? Okay, I think two things. One um, is the respect for a more diversified framework of teaching in us in our university systems. I've also worked in the United States at the University of Florida. Uh, and what I'm seeing in, for example, in uh, Asia, because I'm also an editor for the Perspectives on Asian Tourism, um, is that our Asian scholars or African scholars do not yet have the confidence to create their own methodology, their own way of doing things because the, the, because of the theories that we teach them are very, from a very westernized framework. So they don't have the confidence to step out and incorporate a lot of the Asian hospitality or oriental values, for example. And we need to offer this as an alternative framework uh, in our teaching so that they can apply it in, in practical sense. The second thing I see, which is a problem, is that we teach our students so many different skills, including critical thinking skills, which we talked about for a long time. And industry is saying, you know, we still don't have uh, your graduates being able to fulfill a lot of our, our needs, right? But I think one skill that we haven't yet taught our students to do, and that's important, in 2030, when we have robots and artificial intelligence coming in, is uh, reflective skills. We haven't taught our students how to reflect on the things that they learn and they do in the industry. And so how does that, like we talk about climate change and why people aren't changing yet, why they say one thing, I'm a, I'm a sustainable tourist, but I don't add sustainability. is because I think for me, I believe it's the lack of reflective skills to reflect on. People don't know how to ask the questions to reflect, and when they ask the right questions to reflect and have the answers, they don't know what to do with the answers. I, that's what I'm finding with my students in the classrooms today, and I think that would equip them for 2030. Thank you. Um, I'm just, many academics are just talking about things. I'm a little bit the opposite. I'm a much more doer. So I really want to give you one minute and I really want you to write down three things that you will do with your local university, whoever academic you know, and if you don't know anybody, come and speak to me and I'll get you connected with someone not close to you. What are you going to do to influence the agenda, to influence the education, to influence the talent development and talent management towards 2030? What are you going to do? Because we are going to panels like that from time to time, you know, every, every three weeks. And we're talking about what people will be doing. 
but what are you going to do? How can you influence that? Who are you going to speak into actually developing the agenda? And the ministers, how are you going to, to talk to your minister of education? Because they operate in a different sphere and they do not necessarily, uh, uh, they do not necessarily cross the, the wires to actually understand what is required from the industry, how the tourism industry is required, because they are going different kind of, 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 of platforms, platforms and different kind of lines. One minute, please write that down. Three things that you are going to do, three things that you are going to do. I don't have the time to actually go around with a microphone. Write that down, three things that you are going to do to influence the agenda. And then I'll come back to the panel and I'll ask the panel, how can we work more closely together, academia with industry, with destinations, with the students? How can we have a conversation? And how can we take these things forward in a much more holistic, um, what's the word that you use, diverse way, that we actually meet the requirements of the future? Rather than, you say, the traditional Maltese universities that have always done that and we keep doing it. How are we going to influence that, dis that discussion? Okay. That will be the discussion that we're going to have in a minute uh, once these guys have got, uh, have written down the three things that they will do. Yeah? Have you written three things? Who has written three things down? Who is still waiting? There's an exam, right? I'm a professor after all. There's an exam. You're not going to escape the exam. Okay, Susanna, if we start with you, what can you do to actually improve the dialogue between all the stakeholders and co-create value in this process. Can I, can I be a naughty student and not, not answer your question? Um, because You're I not was gonna pass. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking earlier on, and which my comment was supposed to be, and you sort of looked at the crystal ball. I would like to step one step backwards and, and go into that level of discussion within that uh, framework in the country level. Um, if, you, if you guys follow educational rankings, you probably have noticed that Finland is quite usually on, on the top of PISA and whatever results. And this is due to the fact that as a small nation, we have set ourselves a, a sort of a goal where we want to be at a certain time in the educational framework. And it means that even the kindergarten teachers have a master's level education. A teacher's um, job is highly respected and very well paid job in Finland. And it means that in all levels, you have academic freedom to do things. So we're very flexible in when we teach. And as a student, for example, or as a, uh, sorry, as a senior lecturer, if I decide to do something today with my students tomorrow, I can do it without any sort of auditing or whatever bureaucratic thing with the ministry or whatever. We have a huge uh, independence because we are relied as the specialists in what we do. And, and we work closely with the industry so that we sort of try to be in the same, same level with them. And I think for those emerging countries who are sitting here, this is how you have to start. As a, as a state, you have to set goals where you want to be as a nation, not as a tourist destination, but as a nation for the whole civilization of the, that sort of population. And this is where it starts. How are we going to benefit? Who, you in the industry, now you're a student, how can we learn from each other? How can we make the tools more relevant to what you need? Um, I expect uh, the education here is more related to the, um, the industry, what's at present. Uh, in the past, we learned lots of theories, uh, less all the case studies uh, in the past maybe 10 years, 20 years. But nowadays, especially uh, China, the online uh, tourism is booming, but the education is far behind. So like uh, when we study in the school, I expect more case study and uh, give us more leading uh, what's the trend it will be happened in the industry. Thank you. Andrew, very direct question to you because you're influential in Malta, okay. So what are you gonna do? Bring your universities together and bring your Maltese university and academic and say to them, listen, to be 20, to be competitive in 2030, we would like you to teach this to the young guys. What are you gonna do? Who are you gonna bring together? 
I wear two hats. I, I'm, I'm the, the CEO for the Malta Hotels and Restaurants Association. And um, this led me, because this was an issue that we were facing, to create, to, to found uh, the Mediterranean Tourism Foundation, which is a more regional structure, because in today's world, one needs to look more at a region level rather than just a particular country or a specific destination. So this was the first um, step that we did eight years ago, and we're building on it. So we're driving now. We want. We 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 are we are being the change that we want to see it's by bringing all the stakeholders together, by using different vehicles. For example, music. One of the biggest challenges is to attract, first of all, the students to be part of our industry. So what we've done, we chose music because music is a is, a, is an international language um, uh, to show that the tourism sector is not just about hospitality, but it's, the, it's part of the entertainment world. It's about fun. It's about making things happen. On the 4th of October, we set Malta as the stage for the Mediterranean pop stars. We had over 40,000 people coming for this, for this event. And I can tell you that in the, in the following weeks, the number of CVs that I receive of people who want to be part of my organization, part of the hotel sector, because of course we gave a lot of exposure to the hotels through this event. Um, uh, it's incredible. In a situation when Malta currently is facing full employment and it's very difficult to find people to work with, with your structure. So being concrete, being diff thinking outside the box, um, um, it, 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 at the end of the day, it will appeal to people to join the sector, to be part of the sector. A couple of days, bring everybody together, give them food and a lot of alcohol, <laughs> and actually get them to to think creatively and, and interact more. Nigel, for me, it's actually a much bigger and wider challenge than the what, than the question you just set about what do we get our universities to do by 2030. We're talking about African islands and emerging market scene. Many of those countries do not have universities or academic um, organizations that, that have travel and tourism opportunities. They don't teach it. So if you're an investor sitting in this room and you want to work with an emerging market, you have to invest at grassroots, which includes building the infrastructure to have a long-term solution to educate the people that you are expecting to deliver the return on investment you put in. My experience is that a lot of African countries have got education systems, they've got universities and they're doing a lot of things, but they don't have the resources Absolutely. to actually bring things up to date. And one of, the, one of the things that we may actually find a way of doing it is doing a twinning process that each university, you know, Griffith, you know, um, uh, Turku, Bournemouth, is adopting one university in Africa where we may fly out professors for one week, we can give them material, case studies, books, and whatever, and engage them in the opportunity. Give a scholarship for someone to come along to, to, spend, to spend a year with us, that will, that will bring um, things up. So we need to find some kind of wonderful opportunity to, um, to bring resources, knowledge, and expertise um, and, 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 and go, go around. And also the ministers may actually like to sponsor some of these activities. Because let's face it, there's a lot of money that's wasted in Africa in a lot of other places. Completely agree. Now, if you go to the world travel market in many other places, you'll see how much money it's spent on, how many people are coming and all the rest of it. If we have one less official going to one of these events and we keep this money for someone to come and do a master's and get some material, it will enable us the interaction. And it needs to be a priority. And it needs to be something that the ministers and the tourism sector will need to actually bring together. I mean, our colleague here from China, she was talking about, I'm having two and a half thousand, two and a half thousand hotels. I would actually like to see 0.5% of the turnover put on a pot to develop the talent who is gonna manage those. Um, I, we had some colleagues from Qatar, they came along, and they were saying, we'd like our, student, our, our people to come and do your degrees. And I said, okay, they are not going to do the practical bit, but what you, you are now acquiring so many hotels 
that someone has got to manage those assets. And we need to actually invest a little bit of that in developing the knowledge that will help us uh, invest in and, and manage those investments. So it's a two-way thing. We need to work together across different, different It areas. is, and if I may, I'll give you one very simple and very quick example. Many sub-Saharan African tourist boards do not have the funding available to attend trade shows like WTM. So if they do manage to come, it's usually because the private sector has invested their own money to come. They don't know how to act or behave at a trade show, yep. so we run courses on how to get the most opportunity from attending a trade show that you're spending thousands of dollars to attend. And you can see the difference after the event when you compare it against countries they benchmark against, how successful they've been, because they've just learned how to work a trade show. Absolutely. So a little bit of investment and twinning. I'm looking into concrete action. Investment, twinning, understanding the importance, private sector, please help, and everything goes together. Agree completely. Yeah. Catherine, last word. What Nigel has just described cannot be done in the university system because let's, um, let's just very quick show of hands, how many of you have worked with academics in delivering outputs and products for your company, for your destinations? Right, okay, not, not many, yeah. So this statistics is higher than what's real out there in this room, which is good. Uh, but, you know, out there, we always talk about bridging academia and industry, but that doesn't, that rarely happens because just with an example that you've just given, a lot of academics cannot deliver this result because they don't have that relevant industry updated experience. So they're not able to deliver this. And, um, and hence, hence the problem, we don't speak the same language. Academics don't have that kind of experience. They need to have this experience. Um, I developed a micro-credential uh, for Griffith University. We are actually the number two university in the world for hospitality and tourism training. And yet, it's a hard sell to industry to say, come and do our courses. We are number two in the world. Because then they say, what do you know about the last, say for example, give us five tips for researching our customers. We know the theory, but we can't deliver it in their language, and so it becomes irrelevant. So I have then have to train my colleagues to first speak their language and you know, turn the theory into, into practical. I cannot send a lot of my colleagues who are really good at their jobs because they research these things, they can't, they can't deliver training to industry. What can they do? Let's keep it positive. There are a lot of academics that they can do a lot of these things, and a lot of industry people who can come in and they engage. I think the more we dance together, the better it is. And I think that's a good point, actually, to finish. Let's dance more together. You liked a quick one. Daniela, can I have a quick one? <laughs> one very quick one. Uh, look, I've got uh, uh, 40 years manufacturing experience of textile and engineering industry. And uh, I've been to 60 countries. Now I want to tell you where you've missed out. This has been a wonderful gathering. Very, very nice. I'm very happy. But you see, end of the day, you are what you want to know, how do we create jobs for tourism industry? Now, you need micro, small, medium enterprises. What you need is a vocational training center where people can understand how to produce garments for hotel industry, how to produce napkins, tablecloths, bed sheets, and stuff like that. If you can do this, you can create jobs, and everybody will be happy. Thank you. We need to create experience more than any, anything else. And we need to bring together the different ingredients to experience. And I think in order to do that, we need to dance together. Industry, destinations, academics, students. Um, and that's why we bring our students. Uh, you know, the students who are helping you at all kinds of problems university. And we bring them here to meet. So during the break, during, during dinner, meet a student, meet an academic. Let's dance together. Thank you very much. Daniela.
Thank you, Parnell. Okay, before you all leave your seats and go and get changed for the dinner, I'm just going to invite Rajan to come on stage and he has 120 seconds to um, basically focus on some of the highlights of today. Rajan, I'm sure you're very capable of doing this. And before I do that, I just want to give you all a huge round of applause because you've all stayed here all day and done an amazing job. And also, great thanks to the speakers. You've all worked really hard, and I think we've created some amazing ideas and amazing content today. And I'll let Rajan wrap it up. After that, we have to leave this room as quickly as possible because um, the hotel need to get this room turned around. And we'll be back here for very well-deserved drinks at 7.30. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to Daniela as well. Great job today. Hard job and really well done. Okay, that is about 98 seconds left. Here we go. Let's just whiz through the highlights of the day. Number one, some amazing people here. I've got to say, you look at these panels, really sharp people, and you can think, God, I could spend hours listening to them. Obviously, you want breaks in between, but I, I could spend hours listening to them. Each of them has so much to offer. My takeaways, really quickly. Number one, tourism. This is what Christopher said. Tourism is still not taken seriously enough by governments. It's huge industry. Governments are not thinking in joined up terms and taking it seriously enough. Number two, women. Women make 70% of the decisions about travel, but only 33% of them are in managerial um, jobs. 50% are in the workforce. Why don't we have panels where there are equal numbers of women and men? Even today, that wasn't the case. That should be the future. That has to be the future. Um, why, um, sorry, it's uh, interesting that to what um, Najib said, which is that he doesn't sell animals and wildlife, he sells the experience of animals and wildlife. That is the future again, experiential stuff. Saudi is open for business, we learned that lesson. Um, Fiona on climate change, it's really interesting, the water table is falling. There's no longer two rainy seasons a year, there's one and a half. Um, and we can't talk about growth without talking about sustainability. Growth is irrelevant without sustainability. I thought that, um, you know, we really learned from the session where we had the, uh, the, Af the nations, sorry, the islands and the African nations. Africa is on the front foot. Africa is the future, and they are ready for it, I mean, which, which is really, you know, heartening, I think. Jeremy Jauncey on future, on the future, and, and beautiful, he's from Beautiful Destinations. He was talking about the power of social media. Um, you know, he's got a whole new campaign with Jamaica starting up in January. We didn't see that, but we saw the Egypt one. Now, five years ago, you'd never have seen something like that about Egypt. The way that Egypt is transforming itself. It's, it's basically come up to date with the modern world. Uh, brilliant. Good to know. Um, I thought what Ben was saying uh, was really interesting because, yeah, nation building and nation, sorry, nation branding is not the same as na national tourism branding. They're different things, but it is about a narrative creating the narrative and making sure that the people who actually live in the local communities who work in those destinations share that narrative and express that narrative. It has to be something that we all do together. I love the idea that, um, that, Taleb, that Taleb pointed out, which is that tourism is so slow that we can get a man to the moon before we invent a suitcase with two wheels. I mean, absolutely spot on. So that's got to change. You just heard that panel on, on education, training, and next, the next generation. The fact is that the power and responsibility of this industry of ours, we underestimate it at our peril. We have responsibility as well as power. Enjoy this evening's gala. It's going to be an all singing, all dancing event. That is just Taleb and Najib. Um, you're singing, aren't you? Yeah, you are. And tomorrow morning, we start early. I know we talked about the rugby that's going to be in the background, but please come tomorrow. Some great speakers again. Can I thank you all and thank everybody who's contributed today for a great, great, great day. Thank you. <laughs>